Good. Apologies. It was um, it was an issue on my end. So <laughs> hopefully the only little road bump. Uh, Good. That apologies. In the way. It was um, it was an issue on my end. So fantastic. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Dermot MacDonald. Uh, I'm a research associate here at the UK Data Service. Uh, welcome to my kitchen um, as well. Uh, today is part of our uh, kind of brand new coding demonstrations um, series. Uh, so the first one is Introduction to Python for Social Scientists. Uh, we're going to spend about you know 25 minutes going through um, a social science task that can be completed in Python. Um, and I'll take some questions uh, at the end as well. Any comments? Loads of you are doing it already. Um, you can post it in the chat function. Uh, Otherwise, if you haven't signed up to Twitch, you can uh, contact me on my uh, Twitter handle, um, which I will, uh, well, it's at DearMidMax, so my uh, first name and the first two letters of my uh, second name. Uh, if not, I'll put my email contact details uh, up on the screen um, at the end as well, and you can contact me um, with any questions or comments or criticisms. Yes, excellent. So today um, we will look at Python um, as a tool for uh, social science uh, data uh, analysis. So this script uh, that we're going to work through today um, is available um, online. Um, I will show you the link if you want to follow along. Um, don't worry if you if you don't want to um, run the script at the same time as me. It's totally fine to just watch what I'm doing uh, and then revisit the script um, later on as well. Um, I will just show you uh, where you can get the script if you want. Um, so I'll just... Uh, show you this link uh, up here in the top toolbar. Uh, so on GitHub, the UK Data Service uh, has a, a repository uh, called Code Demos uh, that you can see up here. If you type that into your um, uh, toolbar, you'll be able to um, follow along with what we're doing. Um, and hopefully my lovely assistant, Julia, will type into the chat um, this link here as well so you don't have to worry um, about typing it up. Um, so Julia will uh, post that link uh, in the next couple of seconds. But for now, all you need to do is actually uh, follow along uh, with what I'm doing. So we've created an interactive uh, coding document. Um, it's called the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, some of you may have seen this um, before. It's a way basically of combining code, results, and narrative into a single document. Um, there's lots of ways of writing Python code. Um, you can write it in a plain text file and save it as a Python file. There's tools called Spider, um, lots of other uh, environments for writing Python. I quite like Jupyter Notebook. It's open source, uh, so it's free. It comes with one of the main installations of Python, so there's nothing extra you need to do um, to use it. Uh, and hopefully, as you'll see today, it's quite a, it's quite a nice uh, tool. It's quite, it's quite well formatted and it's very uh, powerful. Uh, so today we've got uh, two aims and I'll increase the uh, size just so you can see it a wee bit. Um, so we're gonna demonstrate how to use Python uh, for a typical social science research activity. Uh, today is about um, the kind of things social scientists need to do. That's very broadly defined. Um, also, if you're not from the social sciences, uh, today will still be relevant for learning Python but it's particularly useful uh, for those of you who are social scientists. And we're also gonna try and cultivate your computational thinking as well through this example. The main task of being a programmer, uh, and it's the, the skill that really earns the big bucks, as they say, it's being able to solve uh, problems. Yes, some of those problems are quite technical and quite advanced, but ultimately programming is about writing code that solves some kind of problem. Uh, so we're gonna do that uh, today as well. So I'm going to enter slideshow mode. So this is, should look uh, nice uh, and formatted. Perfect. And I can adjust the size as we go. So if I see comments, um, then uh, I can easily 
enlarge, make it smaller. Um, so we'll settle on this uh, just now. So all I've basically done is I've turned my Jupyter Notebook um, into a presentation and you can interact with the Jupyter Notebook uh, as follows. So here's my first really simple Python program. I'm gonna run it. So I've pressed Shift and Enter on my keyboard. Um, it's asked me for my name. I'll enter it and it sends me a nice little message uh, about enjoying learning Python. So as you can see, uh, Python to begin with is a very English language based uh, programming language. So if you want to print a message to the screen, you use the print command. If you want to get input from a user, you use the input method uh, as follows. So let's get straight down uh, to our social science research uh, example. So Python's a really powerful tool. Um, you may have heard of big data analytics, deep learning, neural networks, artificial intelligence, all these advanced kind of things can be done um, in Python. So it's got some really nice methods and techniques that we're going to find very useful as social scientists. So for example, let's say a file exists on the web um, and instead of me opening my browser, I want to use Python, uh, tell it, go get me that file, download it and save it somewhere uh, on my uh, computer. So I can write some code uh, that does that. And then I can say, okay, I've downloaded a PDF. I don't really need to leave Python to take a look at it. I can actually ask Python to open it up for me uh, itself. So this is a, a specific example from my research. Um, I'm a charity sector researcher, uh, and here's one of the annual accounts for a charity based in England uh, and Wales. So that's a really simple example. You can collect data from the web, and next week we're gonna look at some um, techniques for doing that. Python's also really good for interactive visualizations. Uh, so here's one I, I wrote earlier. So all I'm doing is loading in something I created before. Um, this is known as a Sankey diagram. Uh, it might be familiar to you. It's good for showing the flow of observations between categories of different variables. So for example, I've got some fictional data here, um, small, medium, uh, and large organizations. The small organizations tended to you know, um, participate in workshop three, some participated in workshop two, et cetera. Uh, and then we can see whether those organizations gave us feedback uh, on the workshop uh, they attended. Again, completely fictional example, um, but just shows some of the potential um, of Python. And it could do uh, so much more, obviously. Um, there's natural language processing, so that's kind of text mining or trying to find the meaning in language. There's machine learning, so these are these kind of automated algorithms for uh, unearthing patterns in data. Uh, and there's lots of other things uh, you can do as well. But in anything, it's important that we learn to walk uh, before we start running. Um, so today we're gonna to focus more on uh, core data manipulation skills. Um, that many social scientists um, could really benefit from possessing. So there's both the programmatic aspect of what we're doing and there's the social science aspect as well. And Python allows us to do both, um, I would say, reasonably uh, easily. So let's define the uh, problem uh, or the project that we want to undertake. Um, so a common social science research activity is creating a, a sampling frame. Um, so it's officially defined as um, a list or other device uh, used to define a researcher's population of interest. If you're a qualitative researcher, a sampling frame uh, might be a list of documents that you then want to sample from and then start doing thematic analysis of. Maybe as a quantitative researcher, it's a, a list of organizations that you want to send your social survey to. Um, but it's broadly defined. A sampling frame contains your units of analysis and you wanna work with those units, you wanna sample, you wanna contact some for interviews, um, et cetera. But as I said before, prog programming is fundamentally about solving problems. Um, so let's reframe what I've just been talking about um, and problematize uh, creating a sampling frame. So let's say Jane is a sociologist. Uh, she's undertaking a mixed methods PhD. Um, the research design uh, involves, you know, sending surveys to individuals initially. So she sent out three waves of surveys. 
She's going to collect the results and then she wants to conduct um, semi-structured interviews uh, with a subset of these respondents. So the surveys have been done. Now she wants to construct a sampling frame of everybody who was surveyed and then she wants to take uh, a sample of those and invite them to participate um, in some interviews. So defining the problem is really important. It's the first thing that we do um, when we approach a computational social science task. But it can seem quite daunting if all I say is create a sampling frame. Um, you won't really know where to begin, uh, how to do that, especially with a programming language. So a key computational thinking skill is to decompose, so it's to break down the problem into smaller steps. So with the sampling frame activity, what we want to do is find the files containing the surveys. And we want to open each survey, extract the contents. Then we want to combine or append all of those survey responses together. That gives us a master file of everyone who responded, um, and we call that our sampling frame. Uh, we obviously want to save this. We don't want to lose the fact that we've created a sampling frame and forget to press save, for example, uh, if you were working with Excel. Um, and then you want to save the sampling frame as a separate file. Then we want to take the sampling frame and we want to take a random sample of those responses who basically then would act as the people um, we would contact um, to conduct our survey with or our interviews with. So decomposition is a, is a critical um, skill. And you can see we've got these uh, steps really for solving um, our problem. You can think of these steps as pseudo code. You may have heard of that term. Basically that means Python can't understand what you mean by locate the files containing the data we need. But it is a key step in solving the problem and there are commands we can write in Python that will find the files uh, that we need. So writing the pseudocode is an excellent first step for defining and decomposing uh, the problem uh, we want to solve. So let's get straight uh, into it. Um, there's much more material in the notebook about what Python is, what key terms are, what's a programming language in general. Let's get straight stuck into uh, writing uh, and editing some Python code. So when you launch Python, so through Jupyter Notebook or you open it up um, using another uh, tool, it's got lots of functionality built in. So you can start doing calculations, you can start printing messages to the screen, you can get user input, um, etc. cetera. Um, so for example, if you want to do simple uh, relatively simple mathematical ca calculations. You know, we can multiply these two numbers um, together here and Python will um, produce the result for us. Or we can print statements uh, to the screen again. Um, here's a little message I uh, wrote to myself. Python returns that message um, to the screen. But for more serious uh, computational social science work, or just more serious programming in general, um, we need to bring in or import uh, some additional functionality uh, specific to what we're trying to achieve. And again, Python is English language based. Uh, it's been deliberately simplified um, so that it's easy to read and write. Certainly for English language speakers, uh, it might be different um, if English is not your first language. Um, let's make this a tiny bit bigger. Perfect. So if we want to import modules, uh, so modules allow us to use extra techniques and functionality um, that's not included when we launch Python. So the first thing we'll do is import a module called OS. It stands for Operating System. It allows us to kind of work with our machine so we can find folders and files. We can create new folders, delete them, uh, etc. Uh, we've got a module for working with comma separated values files and um, that's a common data sharing format uh, on the web. We've got a module for working with data sets. Uh, it's called pandas like the um, black and white bear um, and we've also got a date time module as well. That's for useful um, tasks like well what's the exact time and date right now when I'm running my script that can be quite useful uh, as well. So I want to execute these four lines of code and to confirm that they worked, um, I just want to print out a little message saying, hey, you've successfully um, imported uh, the modules. And as you can see, um, Python returns the message. How do we know the modules have been imported? Well, Python is a sequential programming language, which means it executes the commands from the top, moves on to the next one, moves on to the next one, um, etc. 
So we only know that the modules have been uh, imported correctly because otherwise it would not get to the print statement. So if the pandas module wasn't imported correctly, Python wouldn't get as far as the print statement and it would return an error instead uh, of the print statement. So you can see how printing messages, while it's a very simple technique, is actually quite good for finding errors in your code. Um, it's a process called debugging uh, and we'll speak about that a bit more. So let's go back uh, to the social science task um, at hand. So we want to find the files. So we want to find the survey responses um, on our machine. So a directory is another name for a folder. Uh, directory tends to get used uh, in computing science uh, terminology. So usually we would do this manually, correct? So, you know, I'm using a Windows machine. Uh, I would click on the folders icon and I would navigate through the uh, graphical user interface and I would try and find um, my files. The good thing is Python can actually do that uh, for you. Um, so the first task is to figure out where we currently are. That's a bit of a silly question. So what I mean is, where is the file that we are currently using located? So my Jupyter notebook, where is that currently saved? How are we using it? So we can use a command called os.get cwd. And you can see Python returns some output, um, a long series of characters, uh, which is called a string in Python. And it tells me exactly on my computer uh, where this file is located. So there's a users folder, there's my personal folder, there's a projects folder I've created, there's a code demos folder, and there's separately a code folder containing uh, the Jupyter uh, notebooks. So that's quite useful. Um, let's just unpack what Python is doing with the uh, command here. So remember, we imported a module called OS, so operating system. As part of that module, there's a method called get CWD, uh, and that method returns uh, the current working uh, directory. So you can see the flow of a command from the module to the specific method uh, you want to use. So it's module name, dot or period, and then the method name um, that you want to uh, use. Okay, so we know where we currently are on the machine. Um, what's actually contained uh, in the folder where we're currently uh, located? So again, the OS module is really good for this. There's a list directory method. Uh, and if we run that command, it finds all the files and all the folders that are currently in the uh, working directory. So you can see there's the uh, PDF of the accounts that we downloaded previously. So that proves that you know um, there is a file that we downloaded. It's not a magic trick I've done. Uh, there's an images folder, which is not much uh, relevance to this. Um, there's a readme folder, which when you go onto the GitHub gives you instructions for how to use the code. Um, there's a responses folder, which contains the survey responses. Uh, there's a sampling frame folder. Uh, and here we have uh, two Jupyter notebooks as well um, that I have uh, created. So good. So we know how to find folders and we know how to reveal what folders um, contain. How do we look inside another folder uh, specifically? So we can go back to the list directory method uh, and then this time we can pass in an argument to that method uh, and the argument is a folder name. So as I showed previously, there is a folder name uh, called responses. So now I want to look um, inside of that. So when I run the code, uh, Python returns the contents of that folder. Uh, you can see that we're going to be working with some real data sets today. Uh, we're going to be working with open data um, referring to the 61, 71, and 1981 UK census. Um, so this is real, you know, individual level responses uh, to those three censuses. Um, it's available from the UK data service. Uh, there's a link to the license. It's open data, so it's, you know, free to use. Um, so we're going to pretend, you know, that the census was Jane's survey responses. Um, so you'll see actually that we've got quite a lot of data if this really was uh, Jane's project. So where exactly is the responses folder? So you'll notice in the previous command, I was simply able to say, you know, show me uh, everything in the responses folder. And I didn't actually have to say exactly where the responses folder um, is. That's because Python is good at figuring out where files and folders are relative to where we're currently working. But if I wanted to know exactly on the machine 
where the responses folder is, uh, we can use a new method called path.absPath. So that stands for absolute path. And again, we get something back uh, that's quite similar to what we had before. So there's a C drive. So that's my hard drive on my computer. Again, a folder called users, etc., etc. And within the code folder is a folder called um, responses. So you can see that there's two ways of ref referring to files on your computer. Um, there's the absolute path, um, which is this long list starting on the hard drive of where something exactly is. Or there's the relative path, which is relative to where we currently are. Where's the responses folder? Is it up one level or is it down one level? In a future web uh, coding demonstration, so the one at the end of the month focusing on your computational environment, we'll talk a lot more about relative and absolute paths. But I'm sure you can probably um, pick up already uh, that relative paths are so much more useful. Let's say I get a new job, they give me a new laptop, it's not going to have the same absolute path. So I really don't want to update this every single time I want to find the same responses folder. So it's much easier to use a relative path. This goes for if you're collaborating across teams as well. If everyone has to change this link every single time on their machine, it gets really tedious and it just introduces um, the possibility of human error, which we want to avoid um, completely. So we have a preference for relative uh, paths over absolute ones. So finally, we're going to create a folder to store the sampling frame file. So as you can see already, it's been created uh, on my uh, machine because I've been you know, working through this code uh, all day. If it didn't exist already, um, we would use the make dir command, so the make directory command. Uh, and what we pass it in is one argument, um, which is the name of the folder um, we want to create. So now we get um, an error. So because my folder already exists, um, Python gives back um, a file exists error. Again, hooray for Python, it's English language based. It tells you the type of error you're experiencing. Um, it cannot create this file or folder because it already um, exists. So because I know it exists, um, I'm just gonna blank out that command. So adding the pound or hash symbol tells Python, ignore that command. Um, and instead, I'll just list all the fo files and folders that are in the current working directory. Uh, and you can clearly see that the sampling frame folder um, exists. So we can uh, move forward with creating uh, the sampling frame. Probably a little bit nerdy. I know it's not the most interesting topic in the world, um, working with your file system. It's absolutely crucial. It's really critical. Uh, I'm sure there's been cases during your thesis, during your postdoc, during your work, whatever it is you're doing where you've moved machine or you've come back to something in a couple of months and you've thought, where the hell is that file? Is it in that folder? There is a raw data folder, but there's also raw data in a folder called data. It gets messy. You can actually use Python or any programming language uh, for that matter to set up your file system at the beginning and then you can be safe in the knowledge it works um, going forward. So let's get stuck into more of the content uh, of the files. So let's open one of the census uh, files. Um, and to do that, we tell Python um, where to find it. So we've got a 1961 census file, uh, and that exists here uh, in the responses folder. And then within that folder, there's a file called census1961.csv. Uh, so when I run that command, um, I don't get any output because I haven't asked for any. Basically, all I've done in this line of code is define the variable um, called census 1961 uh, underscore file, and that variable represents this file here. So I no longer have to write this out when I want to refer to the 1961 census file. I can just refer to this variable um, here. You'll notice that uh, in Python, va variable names are quite um, permissible. Uh, they can't start with a number but they can be unlimited uh, in terms of how many characters, for example. Um, so very, very silly, silly example. This will also work. Um, so if I copy that across, and then let's say if I print um, the location of each of these variables. So if I say that, and I say that, uh, you can see that they represent uh, the same 
uh, value. So the census 1961 file variable uh, captures where this file is stored and the chicken chicken variable also captures where this file is stored. So your variable naming convention is largely up to you, but um, I'm sure you can see the dangers of picking silly names or names that are not representative of what the actual uh, variable um, contains. So let's move on to actually opening up the file and reading in the data and taking a look at it. So you'll note that earlier we imported a module called pandas uh, and then we just abbreviated that to pd and again that just saves us typing pandas all the time. Um, so we can refer to the pandas module as pd. So from that module we want to use the read underscore csv method um, because we have a csv file we need to give this method um, the location of the file we want to open. So we've stored that location in this file name, uh, in this variable name here. Uh, and then we've got some extra arguments uh, just telling pandas how to actually interpret the contents uh, and to just avoid creating an extra variable um, that we don't want. So let's run this command here. Uh, and this is instructive, so we get a warning. So you notice before we got an error. So if Python returns an error in your code, it means that command has not worked. If you get a warning, it means the command has worked, but there's something you should probably um, follow up with. So this specific warning here basically just says there are some variables in the file that have a mix of um, data types. What that means is maybe a given column has a mix of numbers and then also has some qualitative information. Um, you'll know from working with data in general, if you have a variable, every value of that variable should be the same type. So it should be all numbers or it should be all text or all categories, um, for example. But because it's a warning, uh, we know that that command worked. Um, so we're just about to use pandas now for actually uh, examining the contents um, of the file. So pandas has a neat little method called sample. Uh, and into that method, we pass an argument, uh, which is a number. So I'm going to say, show me 10 random observations from the 1961 um, census data. And we can see here, pandas is quite, you know, nicely formatted. It's maybe not as nice as something like SPSS or Stata. Um, I hesitate to say Excel. I don't think we should be really using that as social scientists. Um, so pandas is quite nice. You know, this then shows us a nice you know, rows by columns view uh, of the underlying uh, census uh, data. And you can see there's an extra column here which doesn't have a name. Um, basically, this is the row ID. So row 233,769 um, contains the observation for this person uh, here. So person 387, um, etc. To prove that it randomly samples, um, we can keep running this code. And you'll see we keep getting a, a different, well, usually a different set um, of observations uh, from that data set, which is quite cool. Uh, so Pandas not only allows us to read data in, but it then allows us to explore uh, the contents of the data um, itself. So remember, we talked about decomposing a problem. So we have three files we wanted to find and read and work with. So we're going to work with one file in order to solve that problem. Um, we've just demonstrated that we can do it. Uh, so now we're going to apply the, pro the solution uh, to the other two census data sets um, that we have um, also. So we're just going to do this really quickly. You can see I define two more variables um, that point to the two extra um, census files. And again, I use the pandas uh, module and the read CSV method to read those in. Um, into Python. And again, I get the warning. It's not an error, so that's totally fine. Uh, the census data should have been read in um, to Python. Uh, so now we move on to the next stage in our research activity. So that's creating the sample frame. So we have three separate files. We really want all those observations in one file, uh, and then we want to randomly sample from that big um, file. But one thing to mention just before we uh, move on to tackling that problem is if you've used SPSS or Stata, for example, um, or lots of other software applications, you'll notice you can only load one data set into the application um, at one time. But you've noticed with Python, we've created multiple variables uh, to store multiple data sets. So Python um, and also R are really good for this. So with a programming language, you can hold lots of data sets in memory um, at any one time. Um, 
you know, dependent on how big the data is. And, and that makes it really good for what we're about to do here, which is creating a single data set from lots of other um, smaller ones. So the first thing we'll do is we never want to overwrite existing data sets. So we have a variable here, um, census 1961 data. This captures um, the records relating to that census uh, data set. We don't want to overwrite that. So let's create a new variable here called census all data. And initially it's just going to be equal to all the records uh, that are in the 61 file. And again, we just want to take a little random sample of observations just to make sure um, that our data set variable has been created correctly. Okay, so now we've got a variable to hold our sampling frame. So let's now combine or append uh, the records from the other data sets uh, to the bottom um, of the new one that we've created. So again, uh, Pandas has a really nice method called append. And into the append method, we pass um, a well, we pass one argument, and that argument is now a list. So we can see that at the one time, we can append more than one data set. Uh, so let's see how that um, works. What that's equivalent to is actually um, duplicating the append command. So if we didn't um, pass these data sets in here as a list, then instead we would have to um, have separate commands. So you can see where Python as a programming language is quite efficient as well. It knows that we might have to append multiple data sets together and it allows us to do that uh, using one um, command uh, so we're not duplicating um, effort. So that's a nice programmatic aspect um, of Python. So now we have to perform a, a quick robustness um, test. So we've combined three different data sets into one. Well, arithmetically, we should know that the sum of all the records in each of the three data sets should add up uh, to a total um, in our new uh, sampling frame. So the sampling frame should equal the total of each individual uh, census data set added um, together. So how do we know how many records are in um, a given data set? So there's a really uh, simple, again, Python method called len, L-E-N. That's short for length. So that basically counts the number of rows in our data set. So how many rows are in the new sampling frame uh, that we created? Well, we can see 100 and, ooh, no, sorry, 1.562660 million records. So it's quite big. So we've got three separate census data sets. We've combined them together, and now we have uh, over a million um, records. So for example, how many were in the 1961 file? Uh, again, we'll call the len uh, method, and we can see there were 500,000. Um, the open census data sets are basically a 1% uh, sample of the total census, so that kind of makes sense. So in 1961, there were roughly about 50-odd million people uh, in the UK uh, who participated in the uh, census. So we could, I suppose, calculate the length of each individual data set and then add those together. But actually we can do it all in one line uh, in Python, which is really cool. So basically we can evaluate whether the number of observations in this data set uh, is equal to uh, the number in this data set plus the number in this plus the number uh, in this. And you can see Python gives us back um, a true or false uh, value. So it doesn't give us back you know, a sum. Basically, we're asking Python, can you tell us whether it's true or false um, that the number of observations uh, here totals the sum of these ones um, here? This is called Boolean logic um, after George Boole, um, a mathematician. Um, basically, a Boolean variable only has two values. Uh, it's either true or it's false. And we can use those Boolean values then to evaluate whether something is the case or not. And then that helps us to structure our code. So we can say, well, if the new census data set does contain all the observations from the previous three, now we can save it. If it doesn't, maybe we can ask Python to print an error message uh, to the screen, for example. Um, but that's something that brings us into more intermediate uh, kind of areas. So we'll move on to that in a different um, coding demonstration. So we can see now we've got a million and something um, observations, far too many people to contact uh, about participating in follow-up interviews. Uh, so let's take a random uh, sample. 
So again, pandas is really good. Um, we can use the uh, sample uh, method. That takes an argument called uh, frac, so fraction. So what fraction of the data set do you want to uh, sample? So I want a 1% sample, so that's 0 0.01 uh, fraction. So that's I want 0 0.01 proportion of all the observations uh, in this data set um, here. So I'll take the random sample and then I'll calculate uh, how many observations are now in the random uh, sample. So it'll always return uh, a 1% uh, sample. So if I keep rerunning this command, um, the number or the actual observations in the random sample, of course, will change, but the actual number will always stay the same because I'm asking for 1% um, all the time. Now this brings us to a little aspect of Python which is really good as well. Um, so this is another way of performing the same task. So as I said, pandas is the module that has the sample method. So I could also say this. I could say from the pandas module, from the data frame class, use the sample method, use the sample method on this data set and take a 1% um, random sample. So you can see again, we get the same answer we had previously, but it's a little bit longer uh, to write the code. What's really good about Python is once you create a variable of a certain type, so this census all data variable is a pandas data frame variable. So it's a certain type of variable in Python. Python knows it's a pandas variable, and that means I can use pandas methods on that variable directly. So again, I don't have to uh, go right in pandas. It's in this class. It's this method, and I need to apply it to this data set. Um, again, I can just shorten it down. I can say I have a data set. Because it's a data set, I can do certain methods um, to it. So I can call the sample method directly on the data set. Very long-winded way, apologies of saying that, but this is a really time-saving device by Python. Again, um, it's clever, it knows what type of variable you're working with, and then that allows you to use uh, certain methods. Right, so we're at the final task uh, in solving our problem. Um, so once again, we can use the pandas module to simplify saving a file uh, for us. So in pandas, again, we've got a lovely uh, to underscore CSV method. It takes an argument, which is basically the file. And um, so we want to create a new file in the sampling frame folder. Uh, we're going to call it census sampling frame dot CSV. Uh, and again, there's an extra option um, saying we just don't want um, an extra variable called index uh, as well. So we're saving the full list of census data. Uh, and we're also going to save the random sample um, that we took uh, as well. With Jupyter Notebooks, you'll probably notice there's a little asterisk here. Uh, that means that it's currently executing uh, the Python code. So when that asterisk uh, disappears and it's replaced with a number, that's how you know the uh, command has finished um, running. Uh, and that's not present in uh, all types of um, Python environments. So sometimes you're, you're actually unaware whether your Python command is currently working in the background. Um, let's say you've got something like you know a hundred thousand websites to scrape. Uh, that's going to take quite a while. Um, without that little asterisk telling you that things are still kind of uh, ongoing, you might cancel the script um, too soon. Uh, for example, uh, this command is taking quite a while because uh, oh, it's just finished, and because as you've seen, it's a million and a half records. You know that's quite a lot. It's taking a bit of time to write that file uh, to my computer. Um, but you can see that it's just finished. Uh, so how can we tell it worked? I mean, so I can go onto my computer itself. I can click on the folder icon. I can go searching for it. By now, you should probably realize Python's really good for this. Um, I know where the sampling frame folder is. I can just ask Python to list the contents uh, of that folder. Voila. So you can see that the two files I wanted to create um, uh, certainly exist. At this stage, I don't know if they actually contain what I want them to contain. So there's an extra step. Um, it's just worth checking if the contents actually exist. And as you can see, we're coming back around uh, to a similar technique we saw earlier. We use pandas again. Uh, we read in a CSV file. 
Um, I'm going to read in the sampling, uh, the random sample uh, this time, and I'm going to look at 10 uh, observations uh, from that file. And again, keep running it, keep giving me different observations, um, etc. I obviously could just uh, take away the sample method. I could just call the data set directly um, itself. That creates uh, an enormous um, file, so it'll only display up to a certain amount. So it'll display the first five. Um, it'll have some ellipses here to say that there's a lot of records in between, and it'll also show the final five records um, as well. But there are also other Python commands and tools that you can use to actually dive into data sets um, and uh, look at them uh, in a different way. Uh, so voila, um, we've successfully solved our sampling frame uh, research uh, problem. So let's have a quick little reflection on um, what we've learned. Uh, so we've learned how to import modules. Um, so Python has a, a lot of flexibility. It has a lot of functionality um, that you can use straight out of the box, uh, which is really good. Um, but really, for scientific work, you're going to have to import um, extra techniques. But as you saw, that's really um, that's really easily done. Um, and a lot of those modules get downloaded to your machine when you actually download Python um, itself. Um, but in a couple of weeks, I'll show you how to actually install uh, new modules on your machine so you can use them uh, in Python. Uh, we learned how to navigate, create, and delete folders. Again, super boring, very important task. Um, and you can use Python to navigate through your directory structure. And again, we prefer uh, relative paths because uh, that makes it easier to collaborate with people uh, and it allows our project to move across machines and move across time and move across um, project uh, team members. What you're probably most interested in, uh, you know, as a social scientist, is how to manipulate data. It's the kind of key data science, computational social science skill. Um, and we've just seen using one module, um, Pandas, again, an open source free module, really easy to use. Um, and we can do some fantastic things um, with some big uh, data sets. Um, and hopefully uh, you've learned um, a little bit how to structure your code. So as I said, it's sequential, um, but that's a bit obvious. Uh, your variable names are quite important. They have to have meaning. They need to really communicate what the variable contains. Um, you don't want to write lots of extraneous you know, um, comments. <coughs> you want it to be obvious from your uh, commands what you know what's happening you know for example um, you know here I don't want to write lots of comments you know saying in this sorry in this block of code uh, blah 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 <coughs> excuse me so it is good to write um, comments but actually using a Jupyter notebook you can see it's easier to write a bit of text preceding the commands explaining um, what's actually uh, happening Good. So just before I uh, finish and take um, a couple of questions, so loads of them are coming in. Thank you very much. I realize that's probably 35 minutes, uh, so apologies. <coughs> You've probably undertaken many of these tasks before. We're not advocating that you use Python for every single social science research task or activity. But if you were to do this manually, you would say, right, OK, um, I need to create the folder. So I'll right click uh, somewhere on my machine. I'll choose the new folder uh, option. I'll type in the folder name. OK, that's fine. That's not a lot of extra work. OK, then I will left click on every file name. I'll probably open the file in Excel. Um, I'll do Control A uh, and then I'll copy that into a new file. And then I'll open the other two census files, copy and paste, etc., um, etc. Um, but that kind of avoids the advantages um, of using a programming language, or just in general, just be more computational you know, about your work. Um, as you can see, uh, the code we have here is scalable. So if I had 10 census files, or if I had 100,000, I could adjust my code very slightly um, so that it would loop over all the census files and it would import them all into Python. So with an extra line or two of code, um, I can handle hundreds of thousands of files, uh, you know, relative to my computer being able to have uh, that much memory to process that many files. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but my code is scalable 
more files, more folders, etc. Um, my code will be able to deal with that. And there's also a, a reproducibility argument. I'm sure you've all been there before, where you know in a couple of months your supervisor says, uh, "Can you reproduce that table in that chapter, or can you find those quotes again that perfectly encapsulate that theme that you're talking about in one of your chapters?" And I'm sure you've gone back, <coughs> excuse me, into folders and you've said. Oh, where is that again? Is that in data underscore final, underscore final, underscore final? Sounds very silly, but um, we've all been there um, as well. Using code and using efficient, concise code means you can reproduce what you're doing um, with yourself in the future, across project teams, uh, etc. So code is very good for reproducibility um, as well. And the final argument really is um, automatability. So maybe census information becomes available on a more frequent basis. You know, that's a silly example, but with the COVID-19 crisis, um, the Understanding Society social survey um, is now going to produce monthly findings uh, through the UK data service. Um, you know, that's a monthly reminder you're going to have to set in your Outlook calendar, for example, to, okay, check whether the Understanding Society um, data set is now available. You could use code to you know, automatically check whether there's an update and if it is, to download it. That mightn't be exactly possible with Understanding Society, but there are lots of data sets out there on the web that you can write code to routinely collect. So you don't have to worry about setting reminders um, or stuff uh, like that. Uh, but I'm going to stop talking now because that was uh, plenty. Um, I'm going to work through uh, some of your questions, but I can see my uh, very helpful assistant, uh, Julia, has been answering some of them uh, as well. Uh, as I said, this um, Jupyter Notebook is available online. It's got much more um, you know, text around the, the commands, so you can do some self-directed learning. Um, so is there any homework <laughs> is one of the questions. Um, the only homework uh, I would say that there is, is to just go to the um, uh, notebook that we've created, either download it to your machine, um, or you'll see that there's a link as well, um, so that you can run the notebook in your web browser, no installation necessary, work through that, and then I do point out some um, really useful resources. Um, there's a couple of free books online. Uh, there's a book that you should uh, buy, which is really good. Um, it's about social science uh, and Python programming. Um, I don't get any commission from that. I just think it's a fantastic book. Um, so yeah, no homework except just you know check out the notebook uh, and just have fun. Um, can you import a data set from SPSS to Python? Uh, yes, you can. I think Pandas has... Um, Pandas can certainly import data from Stata, um, and I think it can do it for SPSS as well. Um, you can also adjust your workflow, so you could use SPSS if you have it on your machine to export the data as a CSV file, and then you can import that. Um, but it should be possible to import SPSS um, as well. Uh, let's take a, a couple of more questions. Um, Will you be using Beautiful Soup library later in the course? Uh, yes, we will. Uh, good question. So next week, uh, we're going to look at how Python can be used to uh, scrape data from a website. Um, that involves requesting uh, the website itself. And then once we've gotten the website contents, we need to um, understand those. We need to work with those. Uh, and yes, the Beautiful Soup library makes sense of web pages. Uh, uh, so yes, we'll be doing that next week. Um, uh, we will use Beautiful Soup for that. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Julia. And how do I run uh, Pandas? Um, yeah, very good question. So you'll have seen earlier in the uh, script. Um, I can go back to it really uh, quickly. Uh, basically, all you have to do is make sure you import it into Python first. That's always the key thing. If uh, Yes, yeah, so let's demonstrate. So in this uh, command here, I'm importing all the modules I need. Um, but for example, let's say I uh, comment out that command, so Python won't run that command, it um, skips over it. It imports the other ones, so if then later on uh, we want to read uh, in one of the census files, um, oh, uh, I need to run the import command again, yep. 
Uh, so pandas should no longer be uh, imported into my Python session. Um, yeah, so I think actually, unfortunately, my notebook is remembering that pandas uh, is already in uh, Python. Um, but if it wasn't, you know, so if I did this uh, and then I tried to use the pandas module, um, it wouldn't work, uh, for example. So if you want to use pandas or you want to use any other module uh, that you need for your work, you just need to import it um, here. Uh, yes, so uh, somebody's commented, yeah, it's the um, Phil Brooker book uh, that we recommend. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Julia. Um, I can see the chatbot is stopping some of you from swearing by the looks of it. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you're not actually deliberately swearing. Uh, there's a question about where you can find information regarding different packages, so their pros and cons. Um, that's a really good question. So the version of Python I have um, is called the Anaconda distribution. So things like pandas, uh, numpy, as you just mentioned, scipy. So these are modules for scientific computing. They come as standard. Um, you don't necessarily have to um, install those on your machine. Really, the two areas I get information about packages are the package documentation itself. So if you just do um, a search engine search for um, the package name, so NumPy or Pandas, uh, there'll be documentation you can kind of read uh, about the functionality it provides. Um, or go to Stack Overflow. Um, I think Julia might have published uh, the name or the link. Um, it's an excellent help forum for programming uh, tasks. Uh, and that will usually explain why pandas might be good for one thing, but not for um, another. So actually, Stack Overflow is probably um, the main source of help I would use uh, for Python, actually. But it's also a bit trial and error. Frankly, you just need to um, you just need to Google, or sorry, you just need to use a search engine, uh, look for the problem you're trying to solve, and then read through some of the uh, solutions. Some will use pandas. Some will just use the CSV module. Some will use the R programming language. Uh, it's really up um, to you. Uh, yes, so we have a question about, um, I was running my Jupyter Notebook from my machine, um, but you could have run it uh, online if you wanted. Um, there are some instructions for running it um, uh, as well. Uh, Julie has posted the link to the GitHub, the code demos. Um, there's an installation document. Um, which will tell you how to install Python and Jupyter uh, on your machine. It's really easy. It'll take a couple of minutes to download. Um, and it's really easy to run. Uh, so you don't need a lot of programming knowledge uh, to use Jupyter Notebooks uh, whatsoever, which is really good. Um, a couple more questions if you want. Oh, OK. Are there any security concerns I should know about with Jupyter? Nothing that jumps out. Again, it's, you know, it's an application uh, that's installed on your machine, so it's you know it's similar to downloading maybe Dropbox or um, you know, whatever whatever you can think of. Lots of applications. Um, it's open source. It's reasonably well maintained. I mean, it's an incredibly popular um, open source uh, programming tool. I don't know of any specific vulnerabilities. So when I was running Jupyter Notebook on my machine. Um, you know, my laptop is connected to the Wi-Fi, but, you know, Jupyter Notebook isn't. So, um, you know, the data files are all on my machine. My commands are all on my machine, etc. So nothing major in terms of security, no. Um, just the usual security of when you're downloading or moving data up and down from the web. And um, that's what you need to be uh, particularly careful about. Um, uh, okay, so do you have any... Uh, Suggestions on using the Google Translate API. Uh, the next webinar series that I'll be doing in probably July or August will be about social media data. So we'll be connecting to Twitter, uh, Facebook APIs. Uh, but we, we may also look at things like YouTube's API. Um, we may look at Spotify. I didn't realize Google Translate had an API. Um, if it does, I, I'm going to look into that. Um, I'm happy to, you know, take a look at that, see if it's possible, yeah, to um, write a little bit of code. Uh, so that's a good suggestion. Uh, is there a command to list uh, the loaded uh, modules? Yes, I think there is. Uh, I didn't put it in. Apologies. Um, 
Yes, yes. Let me see if I can do that really quickly, actually. Um, yeah, so I'm back in the notebook. Uh, yeah. You can definitely check um, which modules are installed on your machine um, using the pip freeze command. Yes, yeah, so you can hear, you can see on my machine here that I've installed lots of different modules. A lot of these come, you know, pre-installed with Python. So, you know, don't worry. I haven't done anything major to make my machine really good for Python programming. Um, you know, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I'll, I'm going to add that into the code. Thank you so much. I will look that up. Um, ah, sorry, you meant something else, was it? Uh, oh, you mean, can you use something else for uh, writing your Python code? Uh, yes, you can. So I write some of my Python code in something called um, Sublime Text. Um, it's a notepad um, editor. Uh, so I've got a script here that... Um, downloads uh, fortnightly statistics from our GitHub repository so I can see uh, how many people um, view uh, the materials. Um, it looks exactly like a Jupyter Notebook, except it's very hard to write um, meaningful comments uh, in between the code. So I've got some comments just saying, OK, I'm going to do this task. I'm going to create some files, etc. cetera. Um, but I can't actually see the results of what I'm doing. So if I run this uh, script here, you can see I've asked Python to print out some you know, print statements, but you can see this is a really unfriendly way of checking uh, what my commands um, are actually uh, doing. Um, but yes, you can write Python in Notepad, and you can write it in Notepad++, you can write in lots of, lots of different um, uh, tools. I quite like Jupyter Notebooks. Um, there's lots out there. It's totally up to you um, what you want to use. Uh, there's one called uh, Spider, S-P-Y-D-E-R, and that comes with um, the Anaconda distribution as well. Um, yeah, okay, uh, I'll take one more question, if that's okay. Uh, it's about security um, again. So can you use Jupyter uh, offline? So this person works uh, with government data under the Official Secrets Act uh, and doesn't want to risk uploading or downloading data from the web. Yes, um, so when you launch Jupyter Notebook on your machine, um, you can see it has this funny web address here, um, beginning with localhost. What that basically means is my computer is acting like a server. So, you know, when you want to request uh, a web page, for example, you know, it's HTTPS um, and then the address of the web page. Um, localhost just basically means the files I want to use are actually on my uh, machine. So yes, Jupyter Notebook runs on your machine. It doesn't connect to the web uh, in order to run. So as long as you have the data um, on your machine, then yes, there's no security risk uh, in that perspective, no. Um, you're just working on your laptop as you normally would, for example. Um, yeah, and there's someone here, really good comment. Um, Jupyter Notebooks can be a bit confusing to start with. Uh, I completely agree with that. Um, you're right. Um, takes a little bit of practice, um, and you use the IDLE, which is another tool for writing Python. Uh, that's totally, totally fine. Um, no, Jupyter notebooks are something I particularly enjoy writing because um, they're good for sharing. You know, it would be quite tough um, to turn this to make you guys read. You know, this uh, as opposed to you know reading lots of comments explaining the code so um but yeah it's your work uh, if you want to use python if you want to use r if you want to use whatever it is you want to use that's totally fine um yeah i'm not going to push uh, for you to use a particular type um yeah okay um so as we've established the only homework is um just uh viewing this notebook here when you get a chance um as I said, I've written a little bit more about what a programming language is, uh, some key terms that are worth knowing, what's the difference between code, programming, a script, a shell, all these uh, types of things. Um, I've got some suggestions for things to read, um, again, most of which are um, free. They're online um, articles. Um, 
uh, Brooker's book, yeah, you don't need to publish. Uh, Code Camp is really good. It's another set of Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, Lisa Talia Ferry's book uh, is open access, so if you click on that link, um, it's a really excellent kind of reference book to using Python, um, which I quite like, because um, it's really specific to your tasks. You're like, okay, uh, I want to use a list. You can just go straight to the list um, chapter. It's really uh, good. So Julia's posted the uh, links to our uh, GitHub repository. Um, I'll also, uh, in a couple of days, we'll let you know when this recording is available. Uh, and we'll also send you a link to all the material. So don't worry if, if you didn't um, uh, get it taken down during this. Um, I really silly, sillily forgot to log myself into Twitch, so I actually can't comment uh, in the chat, which is why, it's, um, uh, why Julia is doing the commenting for me. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll be in contact, plenty of uh, help. Uh, you can contact me directly as well. Uh, I'm totally happy uh, to do that um, also. So thanks for joining me. It went on a bit longer. Uh, it's a pilot. We'll probably ask you for an evaluation. Uh, be as critical as you want. Thank you so much for giving up your time, given the situation that we're in. Uh, and yeah, good luck with your programming um, journeys. Bye-bye.